Hi, I'm Mark Seibold in Portland, Oregon. <clears throat> I've been considering doing this video prior to the solar eclipse because so many people have sent me emails, texts, phone, phone calls from foreign countries. Uh, I get so many questions and I'm not the definitive or the ultimate information about the solar eclipse coming up, but I've done a lot of astrophotography and astronomy artwork over the years. Um, the 63 years I've been here all my entire life in Portland and many people laugh when I tell them I'm an astronomer because um, they think it rains all the time in Portland. <clears throat> we had 100 degree temperatures here in late May this year and early June, which we don't usually get till August. So <clears throat> it's rather cool here tonight where I live on the far southeast corner in the edge of Portland up against a rural highway. At 4.15 in the morning, um, I didn't expect this much traffic already. I was hoping I was going to uh, have a quiet time to talk in front of the microphone here, set up the lights appropriately, and talk about many things. Um, I should have had my original telescope when I was 13 years old. I didn't have that prepared to bring here today, nor other things that I would show. Um, but with all the talk about the eclipse coming up, um, there's a lot of great publications coming out uh, uh, that have been out for years. Sky and Telescope and Astronomy Magazine are excellent. There are new issues. Um, I haven't got the special issue of Sky and Telescope yet. It's a bigger issue that goes for about $15 or $16. It has not hit the biggest bookstore in America yet here in Portland, Oregon, which I was surprised last night when I went to talk to their managers. But their August uh, regular issue for the month of August is really exceptional. It's got great articles about photographing the eclipse. I'd highly recommend it. It's it's a, an easily $5.99 throwaway purchase price. I would highly recommend it. And the new astronomy issue is very well written. Um, many articles by many different people. What they've done is they've collaborated with all their best writers and talked about each of their own personal views on the upcoming eclipse. You're going to see images like this and wonder, how is anybody getting pictures this beautiful? Well, I can tell you start to start off, uh, you're not going to be able to take pictures of the clips like I did in 1979 if you haven't got at least a 35 millimeter camera like I had then, which is today's DSLR. And to see the images of the sun this well, they even go bigger. They'd be enough to fill the page here uh, without pixelating. And that's with an old 35 millimeter, only with a 135 millimeter lens. Now, what I'm going to do when I'm up the desert of Oregon is use this Cassegrain, have my digital camera, a small Sony, like you see on the back of the lens up here. It's hardly any bigger than a small box of crayons. It's a little silver camera body you see here. And there's a 300 millimeter lens on top. It's riding on top of it, the Celestron Cassegrain which will be tracking equatorially. I've got to send the scope to LA here today and have it, its equatorial motors repaired. They just went out after 13 years. It was given to me uh, to teach astronomy over in the Fiji Islands. So uh, with all this equipment here, I think I set up more than I could probably talk about. I, uh, again, I get questions about uh, the photography, the artwork, how to look at the stars, where should I start, people just don't know where to start. I can tell you for starters, most people don't have an H-alpha telescope, which you saw as I started the video here pulling it away, with a little warning on the side about how the universe is closer than it appears. Uh, the H-alpha telescope doesn't look like much here in the distance, I moved it back, but it has what's on the front called a hydrogen alpha filter. It's a little red glass stack of filters. This little tiny cylinder with several stacks of quartz crystal glasses in it, and it looks like dark red glasses when you see it reflected. This little piece alone goes for about $1,000. And so people might ask, why does this little thing cost $1,000? Well, when you look through it, you get to see the sun like this. You get to see it through a special constraint of light band pass. It's very narrow. It blocks out all the UV, most of the visible daylight. And you see the sun just the way it looks if you were to strip away all the bright, blinding white color. When I say white color, I mean the white light, of course. 
So I'm hoping my camera is automatically focusing here when I come up close to this. But that's looking in the eyepiece of the H Alpha telescope there a few years ago. Photograph with the Sony camera on the back of the eyepiece. I hadn't planned this with traffic already starting this morning. Uh, the morning traffic usually starts building at about 5 a.m. So the highway here gets noisy. So there's going to be a lot of talk about cameras. And you see this one here, which is a, an old Kodak from about 1910. And uh, of course, I'm not going to be using this. but. Uh, I found this as a, an old photography swap meet years ago. I had to take it. My grandparents used something like this in North Dakota uh, before the Great Depression when they moved out here to Portland. This is a large Dobsonian telescope pointing right at the camera there. If you can see it, the mirror inside is a 10-inch mirror. I bought this in 1987. And it's uh, what many amateur astronomers have today as a modest size telescope. Public, it looks huge because they've only looked through something, say, the size of an iPhone. And that's another point I want to make. Uh, people think they're going to take photographs of the eclipse with an iPhone or an Android camera. They're going to see the sun about as big as you see this little spot of the moon up in the sky here during total eclipse. This little tiny spot is the moon with a regular camera lens at distance. That's all they're going to get of the sun. It's going to look a little brighter, but no bigger than this. This is what you'd get looking through the Cassegrain telescope. So although that scope looks much smaller than the big Dobsonian, Newtonian, you can get the sun the size of the moon here that I took of the total eclipse of the moon up at the Vista House a few years ago. So you can see where a telescope makes an, a tremendous difference in the size of what you're going to see. Six of the best photos I took were uh, of these six I took in 1979. I got it upside down here, maybe I do. I reprocessed all these in digital, and I realized later after I processed them, I had some of them upside down from the way they were in the actual sky. But that's all irrelevant to the way we look in the sky. There is no upside down in space, so they're essentially still accurate. And I've got this up on my web. Many people have seen it on Facebook or my past MySpace and other websites I put it up in. Uh, the photography world's progressed greatly since the early days of when I took nothing more than time exposure photographs. Uh, things were easy, like a bright comet, tail bop over Mount Hedegrant. And stars rotating around a deadwood ponderosa pine up in the desert. These are old discarded prints that were shown. This one was shown in Astronomy Magazine full page back in 1994, I believe. But we've gone much further now, digital cameras. And anybody that can at least get a hold of a basic medium priced digital camera by Eclipse Day is going to be able to take spectacular photos. I also recommend that people get an old vintage lens, like this long telephoto, a 300 millimeter, on the front of my digital. Now, many people will ask, uh, how can you put an old SLR camera lens today on a new digital? They're simply attached with a little collar adapter. There are many people riding a, a big solar eclipse site and getting ready for it to travel, and that can be accessed online too. Many people are discussing where they're going to go in the United States. I'll talk about that a little later, about what's going to happen to Oregon here. We're a little concerned. But essentially, the new digital cameras not a big DSLR, but very close to it. The new Sonys are so small, you can literally put them in your pocket. But they've got an APS-C sensor that's as big or slightly bigger than the famous Canon. I think it's called a TI Rebel that many people use. The basic medium-priced Canon DSLR. The Sony has essentially got a better light sensor than that Canon TI. It's actually a little bigger. But the body is so small and lightweight, and it's virtually like a small computer. And when you turn it on, it's, uh, I don't know if I've got batteries in this one. Sorry about that. I didn't, I didn't think of that. <laughs> um, but adapting the lenses, I'll talk about that. So you take an old 
SLR lens from back in the 60s or 70s. This is a nice big 300 millimeter. It's not the greatest one. It opens up to f5.5 only. I'm going to be using one that has a much wider opening. A friend will loan me. Maybe even a 500 millimeter, and I'll have it on top of that telescope, tracking with the scope, so I can run two cameras at once and track the sky accurately with the equatorial mount. But you essentially take the old camera lens, your new digital camera, and you purchase one of these little, it's nothing more than a little metal collar. They've got them on Amazon, they're made in China, uh, they're just a few bucks a piece, and they're made to mate to the camera and to the lens, and you'll see the names of each mating one to the other. When you look them up online, you essentially just put it on your new camera, and then take the old lens, which is a Pentax thread in this case, and just screw it onto the new collar. And it's that simple, it's ready to shoot with. Now, this is rather cumbersome. There's no auto uh, blur corrections on these new lenses, on these old lenses, excuse me. So, you've got to do everything manually when you turn it on. You essentially have to put it on a tripod to stabilize the lens because you won't get stabilization that's automatically built into the new electronic lenses. So there is some manual adjusting to do, but once you've got it adjusted for infinity and you're ready to shoot the sun, then you're ready to just go for the rest of the two, I'm going to say only two minutes of totality, and many people want to get a whole series of slight progressive changes as the moon covers the sun. You've seen all these little bright white disks changing like from a crescent moon through phases, and those are taken through white light filters, which are very popular. I have one for the front of the cast screen. I've had it for years, just broke it recently in storage, so I've got to order another one. I'm going to talk over the traffic here. So the white light filters are what they're talking about using eclipse glasses. They want people to put on when looking at the sun before it's totally covered by the moon, and that's essential. You don't want to let people look directly at the sun while it's fully exposed without the moon eclipsing it.